So today I will be talking uh, about a version or a face of free media. Dr. Gretchen King gave us a lecture uh, about very different free media in the Arab world and across the world, uh, both radio and online and other various uh, technologies. Sometimes free media are used by groups, individuals, or political entities, or even states that we are not very excited about. And this lecture is going to be about the group that calls, called itself, or calls itself, the Islamic State uh, in Syria and Iraq, ISIS. Hence the when free media break bad. You didn't get the reference? Okay. You've, you've watched that Netflix series? No? Nobody watched it? It's pretty good. All right. So I will start with, the, uh, with a case study about the Paris attacks. You remember this? It happened just a few years ago. Okay, so I'm going to go through a very quick timeline of this uh, attack. On November 12, 2015, that was before the attack, ISIS sent a message out, a threatening message out. Soon, very soon, the blood will spill like an ocean. It was translated in multiple languages, but the original text was in Russian. Remember what happened next, right? What happened next, if you remember? Shoot it, shout it out. Explosion in Beirut. Second, Russian plane downed in Sinai. You don't remember? And then the attack in Paris, right? Of course, the media coverage focused on the attack in Paris. Uh, and a little bit the Russian plane, but totally ignored Beirut. We're not worthy. So at 9.20 on November 13, 14, the night of November 13, 14, at 9.20, 9.40 p.m., four suicide attacks took place. There was shooting at four different sites and a hostage situation in a concert hall in Paris. Right around midnight, the police storm in. They kill the attackers, two of them actually blow themselves up, and the final toll is 89 people killed. The media are all over it, but all the way up till then, ISIS mentions nothing does not declare it an operation, does not take uh, uh, credibility for it. At 1.20 a.m., just about an hour after the uh, police storm in, we start seeing ISIS, pro-ISIS, not official ISIS, pro-ISIS, Twitter messages and online messages going out. Here's a sample of them. Notice the hashtags in Arabic, but Barista uh, style or Paris burning, and also the French flag with a footprint on it. Quite incredibly fast to create graphics, put hashtags, and put them uh, out there. So, one of the things that ISIS has mastered is what we call the Twitter storm. You're familiar with that? Okay, so when enough tweets coming out with a certain hashtag goes up, in the priority list of the algorithm, and then what happens? It starts trending, right? And then more exposure, and then the mass media picks it up, and then further exposure, right? So how did ISIS first do that? What they did is they used a three-tier system. So you have the leadership of ISIS, top 10, 12 uh, leaders in that group, would all simultaneously send a message out with a hashtag. Their followers, that's the second tier, their lieutenants, their hardcore followers, would retweet their tweets and each one others. And the leadership will also retweet the others. And then you have the broad third tier supporters across the, the world who would start retweeting, retweeting, retweeting. And this will create what we call the Twitter storm. Now eventually, they actually created software, an app, that supporters can download on their cell phone and automatically, as soon as the leadership tweets that, it will start sending it to all your contacts and will start sending, uh, retweeting it. And in many cases, some people didn't even know what that is and they downloaded it by mistake because it posed, I think, at some point as a FIFA uh, supporting app or something like that. At 12.55 p.m., 
That's the next day, so around 12 hours after, ISIS claims responsibility, takes responsibility of this attack. And supporters here again tweet the press release. Now you would think that with all the awareness of uh, this group that immediately companies will take it down, right? And we always blame Facebook and Twitter, why aren't you taking down all these offensive material? But the issue is, it's almost quite impossible to do that, especially the way they send it out. With links, upon links, upon links, upon links, upon links, upon links, etc. of the press release. For every service, you have multiple links. So by the time you start taking them down, by the time the company, the organization is alerted, the message is already out. It's way too late to do anything about it. More importantly, after the press release was sent out, right about a couple of hours after that, a repurposed, re-edited video that aims to recruit was sent out to. The message, French Muslims must travel to the lands that ISIS controls and fight with them, or if they can't, fight in France or fight in Europe. That's the video. Celui qui me croit en ta route et qui croit en Allah a certes saisi l'anse la plus solide qui ne peut se briser et Allah est celui qui entend et celui qui sait. Comme vous avez mis en ta route, comme vous avez mis à la démocratie et à la loi humaine en faisant le hijra, aujourd'hui vous me croyez à ces tawarites et à toutes ces lois que nous a imposé ces tawarites et à tous ces passeports que nous a imposé ces tawarites, nous me croyons en vous. Entre vous et nous, l'inimité et la haine sont apparues jusqu'à ce que vous croyez en Allah seul. Vous nous avez opprimés, vous avez combattu notre religion, vous avez insulté notre prophète. Aujourd'hui, nous me croyons en vous, nous me croyons en vos passeports. Et vous, si vous venez ici, nous vous combattrons jusqu'au dernier. Wallah aura. Here's the core message. What are you waiting for? Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. As-salatu as-salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'il. Ceci est un message pour tous les musulmans qui vivent encore en terre de mécréance. De la part de vos frères qui ont immigré, vos frères français. Qu'attendez-vous Pourquoi vous n'avez pas encore immigré Comment oser Mes créants, où que vous le trouviez. Qu'attendez-vous Qu'attendez-vous What are you waiting for If you can't come join us, fight over there. Right after that, the next day, multiple different messages, videos, graphics uh, were sent out by different ISIS uh, media outlets and media operations celebrating the attacks, the invasion, Ghazwat, uh, <coughs> Paris. On the 17th, another message, another warning was sent out. This one specifically with sectarian undertone, well, not undertone, explicit sectarian message uh, attacking Christians and Jews around the world. On the 18th, the 12th issue of Dabiq, the official magazine at that time, was released. The issue had, well, as you can see on the cover, images from the Paris attack, also stories from the Russian attack and from the Beirut attack. And a pun here, just terror. Could be read justified, or could be read just simple terror. Now, those of you who have worked in magazines know that it takes quite a long time to put together a magazine. We have a magazine that we produce as a department once a year, and we have an army of students and faculty working on it, and it takes a huge amount of effort. 
I'm going to scroll through a few pages of this issue. Those of you who may have had a copy of it and read it will realize that the English is impeccable. There's, you'll, you'll barely find any grammatical mistake. The quality of any international magazine. The layout is professional. In many cases, they even respect copyright. This article was first published in Salt al-Jihad. They don't even plagiarize. So what does this tell me so far? And let me highlight something very important. This is not a one case that happened. This is a trend that happened by, for multiple attacks. Now this is almost the master case where it almost worked perfectly. Some of the other attacks were, yeah, you can see some of the components that I mentioned, but not necessarily. Send a threat out, attack, Twitter storm, media coverage, send a recruitment video or a recruitment message. Repeat until enough people have been recruited, right? But what does this tell me that a magazine that usually would take months in planning, let's say weeks in planning, video messages that also would take a long time, graphics and messages on Twitter that would also require a long time were immediately sent out within a few hours, some of them within a few days. Any idea? Okay, so they have the skills, no doubt about that. That's all over the media. But there's something more important than that. Go ahead, in the back. Um, exactly. 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 These messages were prepared in advance. So one of the most important things to understand about ISIS and the way they operate, and in general, modern non-state actors, whether it's terrorists or not, is they integrate, they synchronize the media message with the military operation. It's not a matter of the military planners are in one room planning secretively, and then they operate, and then the media team, the PR team, comes in and start sending the message out and manipulates it the way they want. No, the PR person, the media person is at that table planning with them and probably contributing to the message. So the media person is, is probably actually influencing the media operation, maybe even saying, of course, this is speculation, this spot attack will probably not get a lot of media coverage. Why don't you do this or that? Does that make sense? This is one of the key uh, points of this lecture. The outcome, of course, EU plunged in anxiety, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiment on the rise, and more media exposure for ISIS, which means more credibility. Those of you who know the history of ISIS, know the details, know that ISIS is not the only group, the Islamic group operating in Syria and Iraq. And for a long time, they weren't the main group. There was Al-Qaeda and then different factions of Al-Qaeda and different hundreds of competing groups inside Syria and inside Iraq. But suddenly ISIS was, took center stage and became the most exposed, thanks to these kinds of techniques. But you would also ask, how does anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment in Europe help them? <coughs> Let me get two, two answers for that. How does anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment help the mission or the goals or the objectives of ISIS? Work against them, right? No? Nobody has an answer? We have someone over there? It legitimizes what they're doing. It creates more of a rift between our two societies. Exactly. If my message is, you are being discriminated against by white Europeans, 
And actually, this is an internalized feeling when you are living in Europe or in the US or any uh, Western country. And you incite actually white populations against non-white populations, specifically Arab and Muslims in these areas, what does that do? That creates a bigger rift between them, right? That just reconfirms what I'm feeling. That reconfirms the racism, the stereotypes, all of these matters. And that pushes me further away from the people I'm living in, in the same society, in the same neighborhoods, and closer and closer to messages of recruitment of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others. Does that make sense? So this was the short-term goal, recruitment. The long-term goal, upgrading the terrorism uh, model, presenting themselves as a powerful terrorist organization. I'll talk more about that. Enhancing exposure, enhancing recruitment, fighters and non-fighters, and offering a strong model for future extremists. And this is the key point I want to emphasize, yes, we all know that ISIS militarily largely has been wiped out. There's only a few more spots in Syria and Iraq they have control over, and maybe a few more spots in North Africa and other Arab uh, countries, uh, uh, and other African countries, actually. Um, maybe they exist a lot online now. They're very, uh, they're very active online still. But this is a model, just like ISIS took the model of Al-Qaeda, and upgraded it, this is a model that a future group will, will probably adopt and will upgrade. Let's hope that this group works for good things in this part of the world. So this ISIS phenomenon, if you remember, at one point, they controlled an area almost the size of Britain. They controlled a big chunk of Syria and a big chunk of Iraq. Right now, let me see if I still have that map up. We barely have a few pockets here. This is the Syrian map. They used to control this whole area. And in Iraq, they have the control of spot here, right around here. But the phenomenon of the scary part of it was their ability to recruit. In 2005, they were able to recruit roughly 30,000 foreigners, not Syrian, not Arab, not Muslim uh, citizens living in that country, from 100 countries, including about 550 women, 4,500 4, Westerners, many of them actually were non-Muslim. So what they did in my argument here, and I do have an article if you want to read the details on this, one in uh, Arabic and uh, two in English if you'd like. Um, I'd like to argue when we are analyzing a group like this, and probably a future group like this, is to look at it not as a group of crazy terrorists, because this will move us into the irrational part of thinking. I don't know if that's an oxymoron. Um, they are actually a rational group that has intention, that plans, that plots, that makes calculated moves. I would say they are a virtual state, because this was their aim, to build a state which was destroyed at this uh, point. And I would argue that they built on the populist craze around the world in the past 10 years, and they used populist rhetoric. The most important part of this for you as media uh, academics, as media professionals, as journalists, is to also understand the terrorism media relationship. There is a very symbiotic relationship between media and terrorism, and I will talk about that in a moment. And this is the key part of how their strategy works. How to cover or not to cover terrorism is one of the questions we want to ask today. Understanding the dual terrorism message, I will talk about that in a moment, and maybe thinking of new approaches to journalism when it comes to groups like this. So first, let's think of this group as a virtual state. It's not a recognized state, or at least at, it was not, and at some point it aimed to be, and I would argue if that state lasted for another five to six years, it would probably uh, be actually a legitimate state over time. It would find a way to justify it. We have many examples in this part of the world that actually 
emerged as terrorist states and then became legitimate states and continued to occupy more of our lands. They just announced a part of the Golan Heights, Trump Heights. Have you heard of that? Look it up, on, it's on social media. So this is not an original idea. I did not come up with this uh, idea. There's a lot of literature that compared Al-Qaeda to ISIS. Al-Qaeda continued to operate <coughs> in as, an, as a specifically terrorist organization trying to hit the weak spots of its enemies. And this was the main departure point between ISIS and Al-Qaeda because ISIS effectively is a splinter group from Al-Qaeda that they wanted to establish this, the, the state. This is the time to do it. Well, Al-Qaeda leadership said, no, it's, it's too early. We cannot maintain geographic, fixed geographic positions. They will wipe us out. And I think they were actually right. Why do groups use terrorism? Let me get a couple of answers. Shukran, Doctor. I mean, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
inherently involves random or sim uh, symbolic targets, especially civilians used primarily to influence governments, communities, or specific social groups. Does that make sense? What do we mean by directed at a wider target than the immediate victims? Let me get two answers very quickly. What do we mean by directed at a wider target than the immediate victims? Think about it. Let's have بعتقد الفكرة مش من مثلا من العملية الإرهابية هي قتل عدد من الناس أو مش مش الناس المستهدفين بشكل مباشر الهدف هو بث الرأب مثلا في 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 مدينة معينة. How does that happen? كيف بتصير؟ من خلال تخويف الناس بث الرأب في في الناس في الأنظمة في الجهاز العسكري الموجود في المنطقة في هيك بتخيل هيك هاي الطريقة أو هاي الرسالة. أيها. أعتقد إنه بتكون هاي هي أحد الأسباب الرئيسية لأنه أحد شعارات داعش حسب آخر تقرير بقول لك هو الترهيب من أجل كسب التأييد. So what, what does it mean? شو يعني directed at a wider target than the immediate victims? شو يعني؟ كيف بتصير؟ طيب حدا إجا لهون. Somebody came, walked into this room, blow themselves up. How is this not directed at us? We're the direct victims, right? We're the immediate victims. How? Does this happen that it is actually directed at a wider target? I had somebody, yep, right there. I need an answer. Think about it. It's a very simple answer, actually. And you know. Um, letting the rest of the world know it doesn't happen only here, but it can happen at your country okay. as well. And how does the rest of the world know? Through media. Through media. This is directed specifically at the media. Terrorism is directed specifically at the media. If a terrorist act happens in the desert and nobody sees it, did it actually happen? Is it a terrorist act? Somebody probably killed themselves for no reason, right? If there is no media coverage, it did not succeed. But what does that mean? That means that the media are actually implicated in this act. They are part of this act. So the problem is when we cover terrorism, we are becoming part of this terrorist act. Does that make sense? This creates a dilemma for us because media comprise terrorism's oxygen. This is uh, Nakos, one of the premier researchers on terrorism too, on terrorism and media. Terrorism has a dual message. One, especially the way ISIS uses it, it attracts attention for ISIS it actually is attracting youth. You would think about, oh, this is ugly, terrorism. How can, how can anyone be attracted to that? Well, if you think of people who have been demoralized for a long time, who have been discriminated against, who believe, and this might be a very small group of people, even 0.1% of the population, even 0.01% of the population, that they are on the margins of society, that they have been wronged, and they see something like that, it's going to attract their attention. Even if they don't like it, maybe they'll follow it. And if you remember the cycle that ISIS uses, mainly in justifying what they're doing, I'm going to give you a strong example of that, you would realize this is a very powerful message of recruitment. And the second one is basically what you all mentioned. Terrifying the others. Terrifying your enemy. Terrifying the public. So they put pressure on the government or whoever is in control to concede to certain things. Recruiting supporters, attracting supporters, attracting credibility, and at the same time, terrifying and scaring your enemy. So this creates a dilemma for journalists, for all media practitioners, for every citizen who is actually retweeting or resending a message of terror. On one hand, do we cover and become part of it? Or do we not cover it? Let me get a couple of answers here. Somebody in the back. If you're going to say we cover it, tell me why. If you're going to say we don't cover it, tell me why. Okay. 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 
ونبرز انه هنالك جماعه قاتله او جماعه ارهابيه وسيتم العمل مثلا على مواجهتها من هذا الجانب. Okay. So our colleagues said we should cover it but in a specific way that does not serve their purposes. Can you get an answer there? انا اعتقد ايضا انه يجب تغطيتها لكن وجود خطاب مضاد يعني اذا هم استشهدوا مثلا في ايه مجتزئه اجتزؤوها لحتى يثبتوا للناس انه هذا الفعل حق لهم سو وي دو نغطيها ولا ما نغطيها بنغطيها لكن okay. بخطاب مضاد اذا هم استخدموا okay. ايه يعني اجتزؤوها لحتى وضحوا او يبرروا الفعل اللي هم فعلوه فاحنا نوضح الايه اللي بتكون مضاد للجزء اللي اجتزؤوه او نوضح الايه كامل حتى الناس يعرفوا انه مش هذه الرساله الحقيقيه للاسلام او للدين او لاي مرتكز هم ارتكزوا عليه Okay. فحتى الناس يكون عندهم رؤية شاملة للفكر اللي هم اعتمدوا عليه ومجتزئوا لأفعالهم الإجرامية. Thank you. So one more in the back. So we do cover it, but we offer a counter narrative, right? Especially when they're abusing religion. Somebody, somebody was in the back. Yeah. Just one more. يعني أعتقد حتى لو لوينا إنه ما نغطي إحنا بعصر راح يتغطى بطريقة أو بأخرى. حتى الارهاب عم عم اتجهوا لطرق جديده في حال انه الاعلام يوضيه بالطريقه المناسبه يعني مثلا حد مساجد مساجد استراليا كان نيوزيلندا عفوا مثال تم تغطيتها بشكل مباشر من الارهابي نفسه لايك okay. فيسبوك وانتهى الموضوع okay. فحتى لو راغبنا مش صعب التغطيه سو اور كوليج از سيينغ ذات ريجاردس اوف وات وي دو اتس غانا بي كفرد سو وي مايت از ويل كفرد رايت ديز اني ون هير سي وي شود نوت كفرد So let me get what, just one here saying we should not cover it. And please tell me what. La, is it we should not cover it or? No, no, I want somebody who's saying we should not. Does anyone believe we should not cover it? Smile. هو فعلا انا اؤمن انه مش لازم نغطي يعني ل حديث الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم اقتلوا الباطل بعدم ذكره يعني. فالتاثير الاعلامي مؤثر جدا فانا اذا ما ذكرته فانا خربت عليهم الهدف اللي هم اساسا عملوا عليه العمليه الارهابيه اللي هي انهم يحصلوا على وايلد مش اميديتلي يعني فانا حفشل مخططهم بهاي الطريقه وهذا حيمنحهم انهم يسووا بس المشكله ممكن يسووا شيء اكبر المره الثانيه اوكي ثانك يو سو سو ذير ار ذير ار اكشلي ذيس تو اكستريم اوبينيونز وان سايز دونت كفر ذيم يو غانا بي بارت اوف ات اوكي ذا اذر وان سايز نو كفر ات ذيس از نيوز ذيس از نيوز ورثي اوكي On this side, they say the argument is we should not be supporting this, uh, uh, this, the, these acts, right? This is why we don't cover it. On this end, we say, no, this is our job, and we are actually putting people at risk if we don't cover it, right? Especially when it's an ongoing operation. If, I, if there was an attack in Beirut right now, I will want to know some what's happening. I want to make sure that my kids are not going to that place, I'm not going to that place, my, right? So I need the information. So as journalists, we need to do our jobs. This is hence, hence the dilemma. There was an example in history where such terrorist acts were not covered. So in World War II, Japan was sending bombs in parachutes across the north, the ocean, uh, into the United States. And they would randomly scatter around the world, and around the US and explode. There's an NPR, a really nice NPR story about that. The US government put, put a blackout on that. Not a single media outlet covered it, although the journalists knew about it. So after several months of that, what happened? A family walking into the park sees a weird parachute down with some objects, and they come and play with it. Boom, it explodes, wiping out six members of the family. Okay, so that's one prime example. By the way, this information did not come out until just a few years ago. It was, uh, it was, it was censored since World War II. It was declassified a few years ago. On the other hand, we have sometimes people uh, recording it live, right? In the US it happened, in Boston it happened. The terrorists themselves actually recording themselves, right? So there's this question, like, even if we don't cover it, somebody is going to be doing that. The citizens are going to be doing that. The terrorists themselves are going to be doing that. So what is our role? But also to add to that, going back to the issue of rationality, is these plans are not idiotic. They are very strategic. They are very intentional. Think of 9-11 and the media exposure it got. Think of the place and think of the time and think of the symbolism of these buildings, right? The skyline of New York, one of the 
most known cities in the world during rush hour in the morning, right? When there are so many cameras pointed at that building to ensure media coverage, whether you like it or not. Train stations and also beheadings of well-known people or citizens of certain nations. Now, when it came to the execution of Ellen Henning in 2014, our colleague here said there's a way to cover things. The Independent could have covered it this way, right? But instead of using the graphic material that does, is the core of the message, the terrorizing message of this group, they use this. On Friday, a decent, caring human being murdered in, was murdered in cold blood. Our thoughts are with his family. He was killed on camera for the sole purpose of propaganda. Here is the news and not the propaganda. Now this is a very actually rare example. There are others, some of my colleagues have sent us them, but the majority of the coverage is not. So both as journalists and as media literacy educators, we need to hammer this message to citizens and to journalists when it comes to covering terrorism. And not to mention all the other details when it comes to uh, citizens covering terrorist attacks while they are ongoing, giving false information that sometimes lead innocent people to be victimized and killed or shot or beaten, or to uh, actually send uh, so much distracting messages to the, to the security officials who are trying to pin down and eliminate that risk. There are other approaches also for covering journalism. One example is using the method or the frame of peace journalism. Now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about that, but I would like you to look up the concept of peace journalism. I'll give you very quick examples. Peace journalism versus war journalism when it comes to the typical coverage of any war. Peace journalism focuses on peace, conflict, or, uh, and, and uh, conf is conflict oriented, while war journalism is war and violence oriented, focuses on the act of violence. In peace journalism, there are multiple parties. There is background. There are grievances that are explained. When it comes to war journalism, it's a boxing match. A versus B. ISIS versus, uh, I don't know, Obama. Uh, Bush versus Saddam Hussein, right? It becomes a competition and it excites us as human beings. And we find ourselves cheering for one, per one side or the other. There are some other, well, dubious opinions about how to cover um, terrorism. For example, Richard Pearl says, we need to decontextualize terror, not give the context at all. Any attempt to discuss the roots of terrorism is an attempt to justify it. It simply needs to be fought and destroyed. Good luck with that. Because this kind of thinking, this kind of method just breeds further hatred and further terrorism. So I want to go back to the idea of populism. Does anyone know what populism is? Can someone give us a definition of populism? Quick, quick definition of populism. You've been hearing it from your politicians all around the world, from the US to Europe, to the Arab world. Anyone? Somebody in the back. Tell me yours. Okay. And does anyone have an example of a politician that recently gave a populist speech or a populist comment? So Trump, can anyone re remember any, uh, a message that shouted out somebody, a populist message in Lebanon about the refugees? Should kick them out, right? They're taking our jobs, right? Uh, somebody, somebody was there actually. Somebody raised their hand back there. Where? Okay, there you go. What's the name of the politician in Lebanon? Uh, 
Je prav besedo, ki je tam. Yeah, I've just read a um, title or a topic of a um, newspaper article that mentioned Lebanon as a depot of uh, war refugees from Syria. So that's some kind of populism okay. because it uh, defamates the Syrian refugees in some way. Okay, but it panders to the base, right? It panders to the base. This is what pa uh, populism is. This is one definition of populism. Thank you for saying there are multiple definitions for populism. I use the definition of demagoguery. Gaining power, popularity, by the following. Exploiting people's fears, prejudices, grievances, divisions, beliefs, identities, and aspirations. And presenting oneself as a solution, alternative protection to the corrupt elite and status quo. Does that sound common to you? Because it is. Populism is not a new phenomenon. It's existed as long as there are, there's any person trying to get to power but it has become very dominant, especially in democracies in the past 10 years. And that's the scary part, because the last time it was so dominant was right before World War II. So what do populists do? They know you have certain fears or anxieties. Oh, the refugees, oh, the Muslims are coming, oh, the whatever is coming, I'm gonna kill you, we're gonna take your jobs, I'm gonna take your houses, I'm gonna rape your woman or whatever, right? And they know that they want to get to power. So by using this fear and reminding you of it and presenting themselves as a solution for it. Now, sometimes, sometimes these fears are actually real. Whether they are legitimate to be real or not is a different question. But usually the second part of somebody presenting themselves as a solution for that is almost always false. So think of something different. Think of advertising. You have yellow teeth? Oh my gosh, you're not gonna be able to find anyone to marry you. Here's some really crazy toothpaste that costs $50 a piece. Isn't that the same message, right? Presenting you the fear, reminding you of it, and presenting this product as a solution. You don't like your nose, come and operate a surgery. Come and go to the operation room. We'll, we'll make it just for $50,000 too. In Lebanon, actually, how much is it? $600? And then you come out without a nose? So there's an important component here, there's an important connection between populism and media. This is from uh, Mazzolini, also a media scholar. Uh, I definitely invite you to read his work on populism. All new populist movements rely heavily on complicity with, uh, complicity with the mass media. And all are led by politicians who are shrewd and capable newsmakers themselves. So we spoke about terrorism and its symbiotic relationship with media. And now we have populism and its symbiotic relationship with media. The media are complicit in populism. If there is no media coverage, this populist thing doesn't work, right? Because you cannot get to so many people with that speech. Now we are also living today in a world that we call digital and social media world, right? So there are very important elements of populism that work great, that work well with today's media climate. The elements that weaken media in the face of populism today are the following. The market logic and dwindling profits. Is that familiar? Companies laying off journalists, not being able to figure out a business model. Blurred line between politics and entertainment. I think Dr. Claudia Cosma was talking about infotainment yesterday, right? This is a new phenomenon that emerged maybe 15, 20 years ago, and there's more and more of it. We see on the newscast more celebrities than we see actual news. Fake news, post-fact society, we don't know what is real and what is not real, and what is actually blatantly a lie is presented as news quite often. I think there was an article about Trump reaching now some 4,000 whatever blatant lies to the media. And lost credibility. In the US, for example, the media are accused of being liberal, right? Trump goes out and says the media are the enemy of the people, just out, outright. In this part of the world, and actually among Muslim and Arab populations around the world, the media are Islamophobic, or Arabophobic, or xenophobic, or whatever. And there's plenty of examples to confirm this. This is a 
message from 2010 posted on Associated, oh, sorry, the Guardian, U.S. to issue terror warnings to Americans in Europe. So this was not the original image that was put up there, though. This was the original message that was put up there. So reconfirming that, oh my gosh, whenever they talk about terrorism, it has to be a Muslim. Right? They took it out after a lot of complaints. But this tells you about this doubt, this distrust of media. So going back to ISIS, what is its populist strategic rhetoric? One, there is a status quo and it is corrupt. Now we all know that. We all know that our governments, our countries, our states from Lebanon on are corrupt. I just remembered reading yesterday uh, uh, Morsi, uh, former President Morsi, the only democratically elected the president uh, in Egypt uh, uh, died in court or right after court. Um, so that tells you a lot about our governments. And I'm, I'm talking about Egypt and Lebanon at this point. I'm not even going into some autocratic regimes in the Gulf or otherwise. The alternative, we are the alternative. The Islamic State is the alternative. And how do we achieve that? By a strategy of polarization. That is not interpretation. That is explicit words taken from the book that ISIS strategists follow. Eliminating the gray. What does eliminating the gray mean? That means that there's black and there's white, and there's a huge area of gray in the middle, and we are the white, they are the black, and we want to make sure that as many people in the middle, in the gray, come to our side. And those who don't come to our side go to the other side so that we have this clash of civilization. This is actually written in a text called Managing Savagery. In Arabic, Idarat al-Tawahash. And you can read the whole thing. I will just read you a small text. What we mean by polarization here is pushing nations toward a battle wherein polarization takes place among all the people where one side joins the righteous and another side joins the evil, and a third neutral side waits for the battle's outcome before joining the victorious, and we must attract this third group. How do we attract them? Pushing nations into battle requires more, more military operations that force people to enter battle whether they want it or not. So societies turn into two viciously battling sides. Here's a summary of Idara Tawahush. Just one second. So in today's social media world, populism even works better. In fact, several um, elections that happened in Europe in the past few years show that those who used uh, populist rhetoric actually received an enormous amount of coverage. They didn't all win the elections, but you would have to ask, what if they didn't use that? They would probably even have lost in a, uh, in a more powerful way. Here are some elements that make social media favorable to terrorism. 
so sorry, to populism. There are no gatekeepers anymore with social media, right? I mean, Facebook and Twitter pretend to be gatekeepers, but they're not. Short, quick messages work very well with simplistic populist rhetoric. Refugees are going to take our jobs. That fits in a tweet, right? It works. And with all these messages, with our attention span going down and down, this is very effective. Filter bubbles. This is what Dr. Gretchen King spoke about and one of our, the ambassador from Canada spoke about, right? What is a filter bu bubble? Does anyone remember? Can I, someone give me a quick definition? Okay. It means that through filters or the social media analyzes how we use it and so we only get ads and messages that are in the range of our interest and of our political views. Exactly, exactly. We have confirmation bias as human beings. This is pre-internet. And then the internet algorithms actually, every time you click like on something or you share something, the algorithm thinks, oh, they like this. They like, uh, I don't know, if you share anything about Palestinian suffering, then the next day and the third day and the fourth day you start giving only streams of information that actually reconfirm your opinions, your ideologies. You become living in an echo chamber, in a bubble, where you only hear things that reconfirm what you believe. You're never challenged anymore. You don't hear the other opinions, right? And you don't even know that the other opinions exist, not just one opinion, many opinions exist. So this becomes very effective. We know where you are through all these algorithms and through targeting on social media, and we can send you these messages, and nobody is challenging that, that, that message anymore. Fragmented, contradictory messages. They actually work great with filter bubble. Because if I know that there are two, three, four audiences that I have, I can actually send four contradictory messages and almost guarantee that 99% of the time, this group will not hear this contradictory message. And you can see that in politicians sometimes. And sometimes the news media actually do their job and put their contradictory message up there. And crowdsourcing, of course. The inability, which leads to the inability of tech companies to be able to control that. Crowdsourcing comes from outsourcing and crowds, right? You can use your audience. This is what ISIS does. They use their supporters to be able to send the message and propagate it. But how does mainstream media possibly serve ISIS like that? How could they give them all this time and all this space? Or how could they have given them? There's one thing we can all agree on. The Islamic State group propaganda machine is absolutely terrifying, but it's effective. As we speak, their media center is producing slick, multilingual, Hollywood-esque videos and distributing them on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Their recorded beheadings and mass slaughters are too many to ignore. But just like our colleagues at other news organizations, we at AJ Plus face a dilemma. How do we report news about ISIS, especially in the absence of independent journalists on the ground? How should we handle their pornographic violence, their news programs, and their softer, more emotional messages? It's all clearly intended to manipulate the world's perception of them. Should we rebroadcast it on our platforms? Should we ignore it and refuse to engage with it altogether? If this is our generation's information war, how do we win? Where as journalists do we position ourselves on that battlefield? Propaganda in wartime is nothing new. It's used to strike fear in the hearts of enemies and break down their will to fight. It also maintains unity and goodwill among allies banded together for a common goal. The Nazis were experts at it. So are the Russians, the Israelis, the Chinese, and the Americans. And weapons, and mass destruction. The list goes on. But the tactics of modern propaganda have changed, even in just the last few years. It wasn't too long ago that Osama bin Laden had to find a middleman to deliver his grainy VHS tapes from his cave to a media outlet willing to broadcast his messages. Even then, journalists ultimately decided what was or wasn't shared with the world. But that isn't up to us anymore. Social media has democratized the spread of information. Anyone, anywhere can post a message. The perceived success of ISIS is through these tools. And this strategy is problematic for journalists. Their propaganda has crowded out independent journalists who undermine their narrative. And reporting on this conflict 
is deadly. The recorded beheadings of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff were meant to horrify Western audiences and grab our attention, but they also sent a clear message to other reporters. Don't come here or you'll pay with your life. It's also a message many Syrian and Iraqi journalists have been forced to confront as ISIS tries to silence them with threats, kidnapping and execution. Even more complicated is their approach. They've crafted a central message that isn't just spread through videos of savagery. They try to control their own narrative using a diversity of voices, news programs hosted by hostages to tell their own version of events, to pictures of their daily lives using selfies or cats to balance media reports of their brutality. Many of our colleagues in the industry have participated in a media blackout anytime a brutal video emerges. For some, that means not using ISIS's footage in conveying the news. Others incorporate still images from the videos because they feel that it conveys the broader story with less of the propaganda. When news of James Foley's execution broke, AJ Plus chose to show bits from the video. We reacted in the moment, but we have since reversed that decision. I think we became aware of the terrible theatricality of what ISIS was doing with their video. And that with each successive offering, we, we drew back. And I think now we're very comfortable with, with talking about it, but without being part of this, this kind of uh, uh, theatrical presentation. It took them just about three months before they reversed that decision. Not, they didn't reverse it. I think they just had no option, no choice. Because what happened a few months after that was the, a Jordanian pilot flying over Syria and bombing ISIS positions, his plane was down and he was caught. You all know, or most of you know the rest of the story. Now, I want to highlight two things here. That when you don't cover terrorism, that's one of the side effects that we actually discovered recently. The terrorist groups actually picks up their game and become very creative. So there was a blackout for a while and they stopped covering the beheadings. Right? They forced them to actually figure out another way, more terrorism, more gross, gruesome imagery to break through the gatekeepers. I'm gonna show you, and we're gonna analyze this together, a video that they sent out of the uh, Jordanian pilot. I want you to focus on a couple of things. I will not show the graphic uh, uh, imagery. Um, the production quality is one thing, but also the justification. This video is roughly 21 minutes, 22 and a half, and they spend over a third of it justifying their act. Going back to the idea, this is not a group that is crazy irrational. They are communicating with a specific group of people, telling them, okay, we are doing these brutal acts, but you know, we are justified. First, one third of the video gives the history, the background, how Arab governments have been servile, collaborating with the West, occupying our lands, controlling our resources, bombing our brethren and sisters and whatever. One more thing, the third thing I want to talk about, something that is not covered enough. It's not just the quality of production. For those of you who are in filmmaking and documentary filmmaking and otherwise, it's not just the technicality, it's not just the cinematography and the editing and the graphics. Yeah, those are fancy and nice, and the music and the sound and everything. But it's the storytelling. Notice how they use the classic storytelling curve with a climactic moment, how they use very specific professional, Hollywood-esque storytelling techniques, parallel editing, telling two stories at the same time. The quality of my version of the video is a little bit uh, poor. The chief of staff, my brother, stepped forward and said to all the pilots, listen, uh, for uh, strikes against ISIS, uh, we're only looking for volunteers. So anybody who would want, wants to volunteer, please step forward. Every single pilot raised his hand and stepped forward.
So this whole part showing the background, presenting the king of Jordan as a traitor to his own country, as a supporter of the West, أعلن تنظيم الدولة الإسلامية اليوم أن مقاتلين تمكنوا من طائرة حربية تابعة للتحالف الدولي في جنوب شرقي مدينة الرقة مدينة الرقة السورية. The plane crashed in the eastern part of Raqqa province. Both سقطت طائرة أردنية تابعة لسلاح الجو الأردني كانت تشارك. Then we have the pilot himself on camera. Introducing himself. Telling specifically which targets, which areas he uh, he bombed. The kind of plane he was using. Presenting graphically the images of Western countries as the dominant powers in the world and the Arab countries as being the weak collaborators who are serving the interests of the West. And remember that the orange jumpsuit, I'm going to talk about it in a, in a, in a bit. And he talks a lot of details about this. And then you have the Israeli flag. The ultimate betrayal in the Arab world, of course. And then imagery of the bombing, supposedly the area that he bombed. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Here's where it starts. The story curve starts picking up. And the, sus the suspense starts picking up. of people killed. There's going to be a little bit of graphic images here. If you have a faint heart for that, you can cover your eyes a little bit. But I do want to show you what they do here. This is the parallel editing. We start seeing the pilot walking through the rubble, supposedly the place that he uh, bombed, interspersed with shots of victims. All this buildup justifying the act, justifying the act of killing. And this time, the terrorist act is not going to be a beheading. This time, they're going to burn him alive. <laughs> And here's the climactic moment. I will stop it before the burning. I will stop it before the burning. Notice here the technical abilities, actually. Listen to the sound, heartbeat. Presenting ISIS as in uniform, as a very strong, ordered, and disciplined group. Notice the multiple cameras that they're going to be using when it comes to uh, starting the act. A build up of suspense. Identify the person who does it. I will stop it here.
they do show him being burnt alive and they bring a bulldozer and it stamps on him in an act that uh, emulates the bombing, I would guess. And then after that, a good couple of minutes presenting all the other pilots who are in this and offering a monetary reward for anyone who kills him or captures him or whatever. So for those of you who are not from Jordan here or even not from the Arab world, this is a random person, a random soldier. But for, I know for some of you here at least, this could be a family member. Is anyone here from the same town or from the same city? Sorry? أنا بعتذر إنه ذكرتك بهالفيديو. Our colleague was saying that she knows him, she knows his family. So this message was targeted to Jordanians specifically, and as you can see, the Jordanian king was presented at the beginning with a very brutal message uh, of of terror, both of recruitment and of terrorizing and scaring the Jordanian populace so that they would put pressure on the government to either stop the bombing or whatever goals they want. This is a very, very effective video that again has a dual message. Not only scaring, not only terrifying, but also recruiting. Because there is three quarters of it building legitimacy, building justification. Somebody had something to say in the back. Actually, I have this video في شيء نفسي أفهمه ويمكن أنت كإعلامي تقدر توضح لي هاي النقطة ليه معاد بيمثل أو عايش فاهم علي؟ عفوا معاد الكساس بالشخص هذا yes, yes, عايش دور الممثل يعني أنت فاهم النظرات اللي عم بعملها ف... فهاي إيش اللي صار لأنه أنا لحد اليوم كل ما أحضر هذا الفيديو وأشوف إنه هو جزء التمثيل اللي عم بعمله لي... ليكونه المشهد كاملا بخليني أصدق إنه Yes. So there was a, a lot of speculation about the authenticity of this video and whether Mu'az al-Kasasbi was actually killed or he was actually part of this whole uh, media operation. I don't want to go into that, but I will tell you this. It doesn't matter. For the major public, for the, for the vast majority of people, the effect has been done. They got the exposure. They spread the fear that they want. AJ Plus, Al Jazeera, and all the other media who said blackout were covering this like crazy. I remember I was interviewed on that, and there was a video was playing in the background, and I was telling the producer, "Why are you playing this video in the background? The background of my of my image, right?" So this did succeed in breaking that blackout and regaining exposure. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I do believe that actually this was, this was real. But whether it was or not, it doesn't really matter. So one more thing to point out before we finish, we have about five minutes, is terrorism and populism in the era of social media. Just one, one minute, okay? So in the pre-internet age, you remember, radio, TV, and newspapers, gatekeepers, you get what whoever controls what, right? In the internet age, the early internet age, websites, we started getting messages from different places, but still, it wasn't that great. It was maybe many too many. You put a, I don't know, a brochure up there on the website. With the era of social media and the ability to track and what Sarpan, Dr. Sarpan Zunoglu is going to be uh, talking about, internet security and a workshop uh, later uh, on that, you can track specific people who like your message and target them with messages and even track them down in real life. And this is exactly what ISIS has been doing. It's not just about a matter of putting a video of recruitment out and waiting for people to come in. No. There's a huge operation after that. Anyone who goes and watches a video, puts a comment, likes something, retweets, somebody is waiting for them. 
And if they capture who they are, they will start communicating with them. I'm going to give you an extreme example here. I will end with this. Maybe we'll have a couple of questions uh, at the end. How an ISIS operative was trying to recruit a white American girl who has absolutely no connection to Islam, to the Arab world, to this part of the world. A teenager who was simply bored. Every day, millions of people were... Oops, wrong video. This is on the New York Times website if you want to watch the whole thing. The first thing they told me was I was not allowed to listen to music. Um, the second thing they told me is like how to pray. They did tell me that it is a sin to live, to stay in non-Muslim lands if you have a chance to, to go to Muslim lands. Because why would we stay in a land of disbelievers and doubters. I live in like a modular home with my grandparents and it's in the middle of nowhere. We lived in the city, we could walk wherever we wanted. And here, it was a lot better in a lot of ways because it was safer. But it was also, because it was also safer, it was a lot more boring. I've met my friends on the internet. I have more community with them than I have with people in my own community. I was looking for people who agreed with what they were doing so I could understand why they were doing it. And it was actually really easy to find them. as well. He is my friend. He always answered my questions. He always like brought up things against Christianity, but in a kind way. So eventually the FBI catch up with him and uh track him uh, down and, and end this uh, relationship. But that tells you if this person, somebody has absolutely no connection to this part of the world or to this conflict, religiously, culturally, or otherwise, got to that point in terms of uh, recruitment and others actually succeeded in recruit recruiting uh, people like them, that tells you about the effectiveness of this whole mechanism. So going back, just to sum up, trying to get media exposure through populist rhetoric, justifying their acts, using grievances that we all actually believe in. We know that our governments are corrupt. We know about the history of Sykes-Pico and how our governments were divided, how states and nations were divided to become weak. We know that in general the West is actually robbing our resources. All these grievances are real. They present themselves as a solution, as, a state, as, the, as an Islamic state. They generalize violence by eliminating the gray, polarizing people into two camps, recruiting people, scaring uh, the, uh, the enemies, creating a community of supporters, and trying to build a state. And I will end here. I think we have just one minute of questions. So two questions, please. Uh, somebody here wanted to have a question, and smile. In uh, yeah. ما أخذناش أول شيء إن إحنا ننشر ولا لا تاني إشي يعني هناك أفكار وبيدعموها بحقائق بأنه داعش صناعة أمريكا وإسرائيل وفي دلائل قاعدين بيجيبوها على هذا الموضوع بدي أعرف رأيك الشخصي بهذا الفكرة وهذا الموقف من الناس اللي بيحكوا إنه هل هي داعش بالفعل بعد كل هذا التحليل هي صناعة غربية أمريكية إسرائيلية أم هي يعني وليدة الصدفة أو Thank you. Uh, Smile, why don't I get your question at the same time, so I'll, I'll answer everything. So is ISIS uh, created by uh, the U.S. and uh, Israel? And what was the, other, the second question? Uh, 
Uh, oh, should we cover or not? Okay. طيب أنا برضو يمكن الجزء الثاني من سؤال نفسه اللي هو هل الإرهاب هو المتحكم في الإعلام بحيث إنه إذا ما يعني إذا عمل عملية لازم أغطي له إياها إذا ما غطيت له إياها بده يعمل عملية تانية وهاي يعني هل هو المتحكم فينا برضو؟ Okay, so let me answer the first question for because this whole lecture was basically about it. Uh, there is no yes and no answer. Like your colleague right behind you said, we need to think of ways to cover terrorism. We cannot thoughtlessly just retweet as citizens or share as citizens uh, uh, the content that they put out. And as journalists, we need to think very carefully about the graphic material, the horror material that they're actually propagating and try to remove that or sterilize that or minimize that so that the information gets in and less of the propaganda. I know this is very theoretical and in practice it's going to be extremely difficult. Every case has its own merits. But as journalists, you need to think very carefully how you're going to be covering that. One of the examples that your uh, colleague said offer a counter narrative. Another example is peace journalism uh, methods. Uh, the idea of that ISIS ha was created by the US, by the CIA and the Mossad has been gaining traction lately. I've been seeing a lot of articles in not very the most credible media outlets saying, oh, this ISIS leader was actually a Mossad agent and this ISIS leader was working for the CIA. There's a lot of evidence that Turkey and Saudi Arabia were directly or indirectly funding ISIS by buying their oil or sending them equipment. And at certain points in time, uh, the West relied at least tactically on ISIS to counter Bashar al-Assad, right? So they've done that before. They've done that before in Afghanistan, where they actually supported uh, Al-Qaeda. This is where Al-Qaeda came from, right? To counter the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. Islamic groups were funded by Saudi Arabia and by, by the US. I would think of it more as, and then it backfired, of course, with 9-11 and then turning, turning, them, turning against uh, the US. I would think of it in real politic, real political terms, that you have an enemy, and there's another group that is an enemy with that group, and you think of them, okay, maybe if I support them a little bit, they can fight my fight instead of me sending my soldiers and my citizens to die. But then they realize, oh shit, they've become so powerful. This is my interpretation, okay? It doesn't matter again. What we are talking here is about a model of terrorism, populism, and media. We need to understand that model. It is going to be, I promise you, it is going to be used again and in actually more creative ways, in a more powerful way. So as media practitioners, as media literacy educators, as journalists, let's focus on the media element here. I don't really, I don't really care if there was a Mossad or CIA element in there. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I personally think in this part of the world, and I'm gonna be saying something very controversial, but I will explain why. There are enough smart, rational, strategic people who can build something like that. I just wish these people would be secular, democratic, inclusive, egalitarian, and work for in bettering our society, not for building something so exclusive, exclusionary, and that eliminates the other. We need to understand that there are people, there are capabilities in this nation, in this part of the world that are able to do something like that without the interference of the CIA and the Mossad and the funding of Western government. We need to trust in our own people. I just, again, wish they would be working for something good, not something so horrible, okay? Thank you very much.